So this is a project that we've been working on for a few years with support of the DIPG Collaborative. This project started back in um, oof, three, four years ago, um, where we were looking at this gene ID1, which we know is important in um, DIPG. It's a gene that is upregulated by some genes that are mutated in DIPG. Um, but we haven't studied this in human tumors, and we um, haven't figured out if this is a pathway that's worth targeting with drugs. And so that's really where this um, project came from. So there's a lot of data here from a lot of institutions, but the short answer here is that we do think ID1 is upregulated in most DIPGs, in particular those with either a histone mutation or a histone mutation plus ACVR1. Um, it is uh, highest expressed in these brainstem tumors compared to, um, we see less expression in um, thalamic or cortical high-grade gliomas. Um, and it's high in all of various spots. In this patient where we sequenced multiple spots, ID1 was high, um, but lower in um, non-tumor non um, brain. To see what ID1 did in the uh, tumor cells, we started with DIPG cells in vitro in a dish, and we first knocked down ID1 with a couple of different ways. And in terms of drugs that might target ID1, there were some papers that cannabidiol, the non-psychoactive component of cannabis, could knock down ID1 in breast cancer and GBM. So we tried this in our DIPG cells. And at a high dose of CBD, we do see a reduction in ID1 in DIPG cells. This is an experiment that caused some confusion at the conference um, and really should be thought of as a, a purely experimental construct. It's, it's, I don't think, relevant clinically, but when we were learning, trying to learn how CBD works, it works through this pathway involving reactive oxygen species, we believe, where it increases ROS, which knocks out ID1. And the way that we can tell that is by blocking ROS with high doses of vitamin E. This is at a level of vitamin E that we don't think is clinically meaningful or that you could get through you know, dietary vitamin E unless you were maybe taking super high doses of vitamin E. So it's not something that we think should really be relevant clinically as to whether or not the vitamins you're taking might be implicate affecting CBD usage in brain tumor patients. When we knock down ID1, it does extend the survival of mice with uh, brainstem tumors. Uh, actually, these are non-brainstem tumors, but they're tumors that have the genes of brainstem tumors with histone um, mutation. When we treat these same cells, same mice with CBD, we do see an extension of survival, the average being without treatment about 45 days and with treatment about 55 days. So only 10 days in a mice, but that is about um, 15, 20% extension of survival in mice. So we were excited about that. Um, and we did see that CBD did slow um, the expression of ID1 and actually the um, rate of div division of cells, which we hadn't seen in vitro. Um, the main thing that we think ID1 does is it slows the invasion of ID1 into normal brain. So in a normal tumor that these tumor cells, which are dark purple, grow out into that normal brain. And in the knockdown, we see um, that knocking down ID1 genetically really makes a tight line uh, and we saw that as well with um, CBD treatment where that tumor is not growing as much into the normal brain. We went on to interview families. Um, this it was a collaboration with Children's House of Colorado where they have a registry for patients on medical marijuana of any type. And they had a handful of patients who had DIPG. And then we took all of our patients at U of M who had DIPG and underwent autopsy and interviewed family. And when we looked at that cohort, um, as many as half of those patients had taken CBD at some point in their care. And when we did our best to estimate doses in that group, the ranges were quite variable, as low as less than 0.1 milligram per kilogram per day to as high as 25 milligram per kilogram per day. What we found was that our patients who 
underwent autopsy and were on CBD do better than our historical controls who we don't know their CBD status. Um, there are some caveats to this, but um, we, we did see an extension of survival for that cohort that was on CBD. A big caveat being that many of these patients received other therapies. We don't know how much those influenced this. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more on the summary slide about how, what do we do with this information? Okay, so this is my summary. And then I sort of added some points specifically from a patient family perspective. So we know that ID1 is expressed in the developing brain stem, but then it becomes quiet in the mature, any postnatal brain, with the exception of tumor cells, which basically turn that ID1 back up. We believe that ID1 participates in the cells invading and migrating into normal brain, and that you can knock that down by knocking down ID1. The only drug that we've studied so far to do that is CBD, and CBD does reduce that invasion and migration in our mouse models. We don't know yet if CBD is helpful in human DIPG. We don't have the clinical trial where patients were just treated with the same amount of CBD to know if it is helpful. It is probably safe. Where we know the most about safety is that there is a pharmaceutical grade CBD, a drug called Epidiolex, which has been studied in patients with a, a rare type of epilepsy. And in that setting, dosing was starts at 2.5 milligram per kilogram per day and goes to a max of 25 mg per kg. In those patients, they did see reductions in seizures, so presumably brain penetration, when uh, with doses of 10 to 20 milligram per kilogram per day. And it is now FDA indicated for that seizure disorder. At those higher doses, there were side effects. So the ones that are listed in their um, in public data sets are anemia, liver enzyme increase, decreased appetite, diarrhea, vomiting, fever, weight loss, drowsiness, infection. So higher doses, dose-dependent side effects that they saw. When we talk to our families, most of our patients were taking a wide range of dosing. All of this was off trial and none of it was prescribed. Most families are finding it commercially or through dispensaries and so that's why the dosing is quite so erratic. These patients are often on other treatments. And so it's, it's really hard for us to, to key, clue out what was causing what. Um, overall, our patients who took CBD lived slightly longer, a few months on average. Um, but this analysis is complicated by the patients not being on a clinical trial for CBD and getting other treatments at the same time and possibly being a little bit different, maybe uh, healthier population overall than our historical controls. So the short answer is we need more data um, and we need a way to study this in a controlled way. Pros and cons of CBD from our data so far. CBD may help reduce DIPT tumor growth. Our best estimates from our mouse data is that it would take greater than three to five milligram per kilogram per day in a human to reach a sufficient concentration to knock down ID1. I will note that C I don't think CBD as a monotherapy is going to be a home run. At, at even our patients who took really high doses of CBD only had a few months greater than expected survival on average. It, the um, drug is generally safe. Um, however, there are going to be si dose dependent side effects when you go up on this dose. And so there is a, a, a ceiling to the safety of CBD. Um, right now, physicians don't have a good way to prescribe it, to control dosing and monitoring. This is a problem. It's a problem for families. CBD may interact with other therapeutic drugs. We didn't talk about this, but CBD does inhibit some of the enzymes that are most important for drug metabolism. And so for that reason, some clinical trials don't allow it. And um, each patient is on a different number of drugs. And so it's a patient-specific risk on that end. CBD may make it difficult to learn from other experimental trials. I think it will make it difficult if half of our patients are on this and it is having potentially some effect. So we need to figure out a way to do clinical trial design. We've talked about having experimental arms where you get the experimental treatment of interest plus or minus CBD, and maybe we can learn in those cohorts how CBD works with other drugs and whether it helps. And so these discussions are ongoing. Bottom line is this is something that we really would encourage families to bring above the table. My, I encourage my patients to tell me, and then we kind of decide on a case-by-case case what to do. 
I don't think there's a one size fits all approach to this drug in this patient population, um, but that there's definitely room for studying this and thinking about this in, in this patient population. I hope that's helpful. Um, and I hope that Keith figures out a way to get this to the community. Okay, uh, thank you for your time.